the Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce, and I welcome you to today's um, webinar of We're Back to School, Now What? with the Morgan Hill Unified School District. They're going to go over some of the ways the kids are being welcomed back to school after this long hiatus of being homeschooled or, or you know, not homeschooled, but learning at home out of the classroom and coming back. And then also some of the new procedures that are going on and what they're following for COVID. Um, in the classroom. The first person I'm going to introduce you to is the uh, superintendent, um, Carmen Garcia, and I'm going to hand it right over to her and let her get started on the program. Thank you so much, Lori. It is our absolute uh, pleasure um, to share all of the great things happening in Morgan Hill Unified School District. I'd like to introduce the panel for this morning's session. I am Carmen Garcia. I'm the superintendent of our school district. Uh, we also have assistant superintendent Pilar Vasquez Vialba. Pilar, if you could wave your hand. We also have assistant superintendent of human resources, uh, Mrs. Fawn Myers. Thank you, Fawn. We also have um, an incredible gem on our team. Uh, it's, uh, her name is Kristen Stonehouse. Um, she wears many, many hats, um, but for today, she'll wear the COVID designee hat, among others. Uh, we have prepared a presentation uh, that I think nicely summarizes um, everything with respect to welcoming our students back uh, to the 21-22 school year. Uh, this is, uh, these are a few pictures that uh, nicely represent um, the actual first day of school. We welcomed back uh, over 8,000 students uh, and about 800 uh, team members are uh, part of our Morgan Hill Unified School District, District team. I'd like to uh, call out a special attention to the picture in the middle. Um, that teacher is Mrs. Hill. Um, she is a dual immersion teacher at our, um, at our dual immersion program at San Marcos. Uh, and she's right in the middle and you can see that her new kinder student is so excited to be at school that he provided a beautiful bouquet of flowers uh, to Mrs. Hill. We're also very happy to announce uh, that all meals are provided at no cost uh, to all of our students. Uh, we do provide a breakfast and lunch. Uh, breakfast is distributed in bags and lunch consists of pre-plated items. Um, outdoor seating is available at all school sites. Uh, and here are uh, just uh, beautiful pictures of the very healthy meals that we offer to our students at no cost. A huge shout out to our student nutrition uh, services department that works incredibly hard day in and day out to be able to provide nutritious meals for our students. We also have back to school and open house uh, dates. Um, they've already been um, assigned. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, the fall back to school meetings um, that have been taking place and will be, will be taking place. And we also have our spring open house dates and all of these dates have been shared with all of our uh, school stakeholders. I'd now like to hand it over to Assistant Superintendent Vaughn Myers, who will guide us uh, with everything uh, and related to COVID and what we're doing as a prevention. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. So the first thing I would like to talk about is um, rather new. On August 12th, there was an order by California's public health officer that required verification of vaccination status for all school employees, both public and private K-12 school workers. Um, and so our district was placed and ready for something like this to occur. Uh, our teachers worked really hard in the spring. Uh, we brought in vaccination clinics and all across Morgan Hill, as soon as educators were uh, eligible to receive the vaccine, we had a very high turnout of our teachers and we were able to open some pilot classrooms in April. And so uh, that was really important for our school employees to have vaccination as an option. So we had already been collecting kind of self attestations and now it was easy to pivot and just say, and now please supply the proof of that vaccine. So as of September 1st, we have about 800 employees, 93% of them have submitted proof of vaccine. The remaining have also indicated that they understand they need to regularly test. And so we do have have PCR self-administered nasal swab tests for all of our employees, both vaccinated and unvaccinated. It's required for unvaccinated employees to test weekly, but it's available even for vaccinated. Um, across the state, all schools need to be in compliance with some testing by September 27th, but October 15th uh, for full compliance of having verification. 
Uh, we have published some different uh, guides here locally. They're available on our website. One is the safety measures, which goes a little bit more in depth about what we do within the classroom in this COVID environment. And then we have a shorter document. It's really two pages. One is what to expect on independent study, which we'll go into depth a little bit later, and then what to expect on health and safety. And that Kind of the third picture there is really the nuts and bolts of what we're doing specific to COVID in this environment. So the overview uh, really of being reopened is our bell schedules and the student rotations mirror those pre-COVID conditions. And that's really different this year than it had been the previous year and a few months. So the last year and a few months, there were some varied schedules uh, because as Lori had started off, students were learning at home in a distance environment. And so those bell schedules have been reinstated. Um, masks are required indoors in all K-12 environments for all staff, all students. Optional for students outdoors, but still recommended. Um, students and drivers on buses wear masks. The windows are open to maximize ventilation. We have hand washing and sanitizing stations installed on every campus. Uh, and then classrooms also have disinfecting spray. Office areas have disinfecting and cleaning spray. We also, just like many other businesses around the city, we have clear barriers where there's high traffic areas in those front offices. Per the new CDPH guidelines for school reopening, there is no minimum physical distance requirement because masks continue to be the primary layer for mitigation of the spread of COVID-19. However, that being said, we still are conscientious of space. I think all of us, maybe forever, will be conscientious of the space around us. And so we continue to optimize our classroom space. Regarding ventilation, our air filter systems have been upgraded to the highest grade that each school building system will allow. And some of our systems are newer and more modern than others, uh, but the highest that each building will allow. And in all of our buildings, the, the circulation begins approximately two hours before occupancy. And that's really the recommendation from CDC to have that air filter. And where possible, doors or windows can also be left open. Um, in terms of just daily health and safety, our parents, students, and staff are asked to self-monitor their symptoms for COVID-19 and stay home when sick. And uh, many adults in the past just powered through, right? You had a headache, you had slight nausea, maybe a cold, you just powered through. We're, we're not asking our employees to do that, and we're certainly not asking our students to do that anymore. Any symptom, please stay home. Um, we have posted all of the COVID-19 symptoms at each and every school site on a large banner so that families and students and staff can regularly see what those symptoms are. Just kind of do a self-check, and if they have any of those symptoms, stay home. Um, they are asked to go home and remain home until 24 hours have passed without symptoms, um, unless, of course, they have some kind of underlying condition, like maybe allergies, and then they can have a doctor's note just says maybe they have itchy eyes or a runny nose due to allergies. Um, all offices across the district are now open. We had closed for a while, and we're only doing business virtually. We called it curbside customer service. Uh, we still are encouraging our visitors to call or email whenever possible to minimize, but the offices are open. All visitors will wear masks as they enter our buildings. We have not yet welcomed our school volunteers back. We are under undergoing a review. We do welcome school volunteers in a typical environment, but in this COVID environment, we're trying to minimize interactions. So by October 1st, we will have an updated local recommendation for a volunteer process. For COVID testing, um, all of our sites and right here at our district office, we do have that weekly uh, testing. It's the PCR self-administered nasal, nasal swab testing for staff and again required for unvaccinated staff and uh, recommended and or voluntary for, for vaccinated staff and as needed for students. Uh, our district is also signed up and we are certified to receive the rapid antigen testing. And the difference between the two is PCR testing is sent out to a lab and those results come back anywhere between 36 and 48 hours later. Uh, the antigen testing, the results are available within 15 minutes. So clearly more desirable in cases where somebody might be symptomatic or in the case of a close contact. Uh, there is a current back 
backlog in the state, however, for these antigen testing kits. So we've not yet been able to implement the rapid testing, uh, but we hope to do so soon. Um, we perform at least the weekly screening with either PCR or the antigen for athletes, including those who are fully vaccinated and our athletic directors at our two high schools uh, handle our student testing program for that. And now I would like to turn it over to Kristen Stonehouse, who is one of two COVID designees. The other COVID designee is a school nurse and she handles primarily our positive cases for students. And Kristen handles primarily positive cases for staff, but they work very closely together. And I'm going to allow her to explain what she does. Thank you, Fawn. So as designees, like Fawn said, there are two of us. Uh, Noelle Weeks is our district uh, nurse and um, myself, and I am based here at the district office uh, in the HR department. So together we attend weekly meetings, um, both by Santa Clara County Public Health and the Santa Clara Office of Education. Um, we receive updates on county and state guidelines um, related to positive cases and quarantine and isolation protocols. Um, we are the point of contact for sites and departments uh, for each positive case, um, as well as uh, close contacts, whether it be a student or staff member. Um, we work closely with principals and assistant principals um, or department managers with contact tracing and, not and the proper notification protocols for each positive case or close contact. Um, we are the resource for schools and departments for COVID-related matters. Everything COVID comes through us. So this, um, this next tree was provided by our um, Santa Clara County Office of Education in um, collaboration with the California Department of Public Health. And it's just a basic tool for our um, principals um, to follow when we have a um, positive uh, case. So it's really a lot of information, but it's super simple if you just start at the top square. So the top square says you have an exposure in the TK-12 school setting, and that person was supervised by school staff. So the next, you're going to go to the next question and just answer that question. Was anyone within zero to six feet of that positive case or 15 minutes or less um, or more, sorry, over a 24-hour period? If the answer is yes, you're gonna go down. If the answer is no, you're gonna go right. And there's no close contacts and no one who needs to quarantine. And so that will be the end of, of that um, use for the, the, the tree. If the answer is yes, and the, the next question is the exposed person, a student or a staff member. If it's a student, you're gonna to go to the right. If it's a staff, you're gonna to go to the left. So if it's staff, you're only gonna be reading from the green um, portion of the tree. If it's right, you're only going to be uh, using the blue portion of the tree. So we really worked hard to color coordinate and just make it as readable as possible. Uh, I believe this, tr this tree is also going to be uh, posted on our website so parents can access it uh, and kind of follow along with the principals. Um, while this is accessible to principals, they will still be in contact with Noel and I. So let's say this positive is a student. The next question is, is the exposed student fully vaccinated? So the um, most likely we're gonna say yes in this case because we have um, uh, a lot of students, more students under the age of 11. So we're gonna say, is the exposed student symptomatic? Yes or no? If the answer is no, um, we are, are going to go, I'm sorry, is the student, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read up the PowerPoint, so bear with me. Is this uh, exposed student symptomatic? We're gonna say yes. They are gonna need to be excluded from campus for 10 days. That's the mandatory quarantine time by CDPH. Um, if not, we're going to um, go down and ask the next question. We're both COVID person and exposed student wearing masks during the exposure. So if yes, they were both, uh, in both cases were masked, um, they re may remain on campus, but excluded from extracurricular activities. That means school only, back and forth to school. There's no childcare, no sports, no extracurricular activities outside of school. It's just um, home and school and back. Um, there are also other 
uh, guidelines provided to the left um, in the bottom of the right hand or the left hand corner. Um, and those will be additional uh, quarantine and isolation options that we will address in uh, specific letters that will go home to parents. So depending on where you fall on the tree, there's a lot of information and it will always be followed up with a notice going home to parents. Next slide. So um, talking about the notification letters, a positive case is identified as a student or staff member who's received results and that they are positive for COVID-19. Uh, this individual receives information related to isolation from household members and the duration of their quarantine, and it will be specific to uh, their situation. A close contact is identified as a person who has been within six feet of a positive case, infected person that has received a positive result for at least 15 minutes in a 24 hour period. Close contacts will receive notification um, and information related to their quarantine plan or self-monitoring dependent on vaccination status and whether masked or unmasked exposure. Individuals who are not a close contact but in the same classroom or department as the infected individual may receive notification of a positive case with clarification that they have not been identified as a close contact. So typically that happens in a staff case. Uh, we are mandated by Cal OSHA to notify all staff within a department or school site if there was a close contact uh, on campus. It is not a requirement for uh, all students or all parents to be notified if one case on campus was positive. Some sites, however, are um, sending out notifications um, per parent uh, request. Next slide. So this is our COVID dashboard. It is on our Morgan Hill uh, website. Um, each week, the dashboard is posted with the case numbers from the previous week. And the, uh, the weeks go from Monday through Sunday. And the case numbers uh, reflect both COVID positive adults, which are teachers or staff, and students. And they're broken down into the um, correct categories. So this one particular is 823 through 830. You can see we only had one adult positive and 10 uh, positive students. So in the grand scheme of things, this is a very low case rate in comparison with others throughout California. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Pilar, uh, Assistant Superintendent Pilar, and she's going to talk us through independent study. Hi, thank you so much, Kristen. I appreciate all of that. Um, as you will see, everything that's been, uh, or as you've heard and seen, uh, everything that's been shared up until this point leads to then now what? A uh, student might be quarantined and uh, now what? and or maybe a student is going to opt not to go in person. So what do we do? So we have uh, two options. We have the short-term independent study uh, model and we also have a long-term independent study model, both used for two very entirely different um, purposes. So uh, our short-term independent study model is for students um, that are going to be uh, absent uh, anywhere from five to 15 days uh, from school. Uh, this does not have to be just for quarantining. Uh, this is a, a policy that we've had in place uh, for some time. The days have been adjusted uh, due to the Assembly Bill 130. Um, uh, prior to the, the five to 15 day uh, model, there was, it, I believe it went up to like 21 days. That being said, um, a lot of the same practices. If a student is, um, going to go on short-term independent study, the parent will contact the school office and will let them know that they'd like to um, initiate a short-term independent study contract. And so from there, uh, the process will begin and ultimately it ends up in the district office with uh, Jessie Swift, the coordinator of student services, and she ultimately approves those contracts. Now, let's say a student is quarantined for five days and then they have to quarantine an additional 10 days thereafter based on uh, Kristen's model that she just shared with us. Um, at that point, the contract, the short-term um, independent study contract has a start and end date on it. So uh, if the student is out for five days and um, the idea is that maybe the student's gonna come back or it could be four days and the student's gonna come back and just pick up their work when they come back, 
Um, but then they find out, oh no, I'm gonna really need to get a short-term independent study now so I could get all of my work because I'm gonna be out more days. They uh, can absolutely talk to the, the school, um, the administrator, the counselor, or the teacher who's um, overseeing the short-term independent study um, at the school. And the, the contract starts on the day um, that, that they discuss as, as a team. So uh, that might be sooner than the five to 15. Um, so let's move on to long-term independent study. This is the model uh, that families or, guard, or parents or guardians will choose um, outside of having their student come in person to live instruction daily. And so we have uh, two programs, one for our K-5 students that's uh, different than our 612 independent study program. Uh, independent study is just that. Uh, student is working majority of their time independently, definitely at the 612 um, grade level, but K-5, the independent study um, option, uh, they do meet uh, daily with a teacher that, um, uh, a teacher that is um, working with Edmentum, and we have teachers as well that will support in that area, and they will meet perhaps 15 minutes per course subject area, and then the rest of that work is done independently. Um, it is not the model that we've had in the past, uh, the hybrid model or the virtual distance learning model that we had last year. Um, it definitely does require the student, uh, parent, guardian uh, to work uh, more closely together than they have in the past um, on the academics. But there is daily um, interaction um, teaching and learning between the student and teacher, just not all day. Uh, for students in 612, it is a uh, majority of, of the uh, learning. It happens independently. There is a, a Morgan Hill Unified School teacher that is um, come somewhat as an advisor and supports the student. So you will, um, there's more information on our website regarding that program. Um, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> So uh, student absences and missed work, I somewhat already just mentioned this uh, in the prior slide. And so again, if there's a parent uh, needing to get more information on short term independent study and what that means, they can absolutely talk to their uh, school uh, main office is very well aware of, of, of this program. And then for high school and, and packets might be available for the student, they might be using a digital platform. It truly just depends on what the contract of the, the short term independent study stipulates. Uh, but we are uh, creating a database with a lot of different um, uh, learning activities aligned with the, the curriculum that would be happening in the classroom, because uh, the ultimate goal is to ensure that students are learning um, as close to what their peers are learning in the class while they're on short term independent study. And as always, teachers are available to answer any questions they might have. So now supporting our students social emotional needs. Uh, this will be ongoing as it has been. This is not new. We're just approaching how we support students in different ways. Next slide. Um, so we're super excited to be able to bring to the Morgan Hill Unified uh, student or Morgan Unified um, students, but families and staff of, of our district uh, for wellness centers that will support all um, 8,000 students and families and our staff. Um, so we opened up four wellness centers over the last uh, two or three weeks. We have a wellness center at Brenton, at Martin Murphy, uh, at Sobrato, and Live Oak. And we have um, a great team, a wellness uh, team uh, that is comprised of a clinician, it could be a therapist, it could be a mental health counselor. Um, the, there's gonna be a variety of resources offered to parents and families uh, and students. And really what it's, uh, we're working in more collaboration with our community-based organizations like Rebecca's um, Community Solutions and uh, Discovery and continuing to expand our community-based organizations because the needs are great. Uh, services will range from small group um, therapy to individual therapy to uh, a variety of different workshops um, that would, could come from art expression, workshops for, for parents, um, and really trying to address some of the 
some of the things that we've been noticing with our students just needing overall well well-being care uh, if that makes sense and i and there's definitely information on our website <laughs> let me say that there's information on our website and there will be more information um, being added to our website to learn more about our wellness centers and if i may add uh, to assistant superintendent vasquez vialba's comment uh, there was a recent study um, that surveyed uh, all high school students or high school students in california and the entire state of california and one in three students reported that they were chronically sad so as a school system in Morgan Hill Unified School District, we are responding to that level of need. Um, thanks to uh, Assistant Superintendent Vasquez Villalba's uh, great vision around creating a space, a dedicated space um, in our school so that we're able to support students. Um, in addition to our wellness centers, um, we also have community liaisons at every single one of our schools. Um, here is a, a flyer that nicely denotes um, each of the community liaisons, their contact information, their hours um, of work and also um, their uh, phone number and email, uh, so on and so forth. In addition to our community liaisons um, and Assistant Superintendent Vasquez Villalba did, did touch on this, we are incredibly uh, lucky uh, that in Morgan Hill Unified, we have a robust uh, CBO, community-based organization partnership uh, among others. And here is um, a, a brief a snippet of um, everyone that we partner with um, so that we are able to meet our students and by extension, our families' needs. Uh, in addition to the community liaisons and all of the CBO support, uh, we also have a superb student services department, uh, and they are in charge among many other things, but they oversee the care team, uh, and these are additional members of the team um, that provide um, additional wraparound supports or connections uh, to that level of need, um, depending on what the student or family needs. So I'd like to invite everyone in the community to our Morgan Hill Unified School District Resource Fair. Uh, it will take place on September 8th from 4.30 to 6.30. It's open to all Morgan Hill Unified School District families and it will take place at PV um, Elementary. Also part of uh, returning to campus, uh, fully returning to campus and fully reopening our schools, we're happy to report that our sports are up and running. Our fall season at both Live Oak and Sobrato uh, uh, is underway. And so we have for this season cross country, field hockey, football, girls golf, girls tennis, girls volleyball, and water polo. And these are some pictures from this year's season. And we follow all CDPH, California Department of Public Health guidelines with respect to sports on our campuses. So that's a, a summary, Lori, of everything um, that we are doing uh, in Morgan Hill Unified and uh, happy uh, to have been invited and happy to share um, what a superstar team we have here in our district. There, I couldn't get it unmuted. You really do have a superstar team. Y'all are just amazing. Uh, so much information and so much to take in and digest and you do it so well and make it so clear. So thank you so much for sharing this information with everybody. We did have a couple questions and they were answered in the chat. Do you think we should read them aloud or what do you think? I think I will. Um, so one of the questions in the chat, if I can go back to them, was um, will the school district start regular voluntary COVID testing for all students? And speaking to parents in other school districts in the Bay Area, it seems like most schools in the Bay Area offer at least pool testing on a regular basis. And Fawn answered this and she said, yes, we have the ability to test with self-administered PCR, kit, PCR kits sent out um, to a lab with results back in 36 to 48 hours. All of our schools sites will have this ability by September 27th. In addition, we are certified to begin using the rapid antigen test results within 15 minutes. However, due to the high demand across the state, there is a backing in the production and distribution of these testing kits. We are in queue to receive a shipment and, and eagerly um, await being able to offer this to the students. So that was that question. And there was one more. It said, will we have um, COVID case dashboard. And Fawn says, yes, we have a COVID 
dashboard on the website that displays each week's positive cases separated by student cases and adult cases. That looks like all of the questions that were in the chat um, are in the questions and the answers. So I think we covered everybody. Does anybody have any more questions? We're happy to take the time to answer them today if you have them. If you don't have them quite yet and you're going to have them a little later, feel free to reach out to me. My email is lori, L-O-R-I, at morganhillchamber.org, and I can get in touch with any of this, these this panelists here and get questions answered for you. So um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, and um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.